Our Newtonian description of the two-body system allows us to propagate orbits forward and backwards in time via numerical integration, but we really shouldn't have to resort to numerical integration in order to propagate the system. This is a maximally superinscribable system. It has a fully analytical description of its trajectories. We should be able to use that in order to figure out where an orbiting body is at any point in time, just from the description of its orbit. Recall that we've established that for all time, the orbital radius is given by the semi-parameter divided by one plus the eccentricity times the cosine of the true anomaly. How do we get time into here? Well, this is a constant and this is a constant. The only time varying constant is new. So we should hopefully be able to solve for some function f of nu equal to time. And then the, from that, we should be able to write the position as a function of time. Annoyingly, we can't. And the simplest way to see why we can't just write down a closed form solution for this is to recall that we've also established that the time derivative of nu is equal to h over r squared, where r is a function of nu. And there's no way to analytically integrate this. We will spend a lot of time finding series solutions, finding various other clever ways of getting around this, but we can't just write down a closed form algebraic solution for this. So we have to get clever and do something else. And let's explore that something else. We start by defining what's known as the auxiliary circle. And we're going to start with just to focus on elliptical orbits and then generalize our results to all orbit types. So we define an auxiliary circle, which is a circle whose radius is equal to the semi-major axis of the orbit, A. Everything else remains the same, but now we are able to define a few additional quantities. We are going to define the eccentric anomaly, this E, as the angle between the geometric center of the orbit and auxiliary circle, and a point A, which is along the height that's the line orthogonal to the semi-major axis that crosses the local point of the planet. So the true anomaly, nu, as always, is the angle between the eccentricity vector and the orbital radius vector, and the eccentric anomaly is the angle between the eccentricity vector direction and this line that connects the geometric center of the orbit to this point A that is directly above point P. We can describe this angle as a function of nu, just using plane geometry. So you can set up this right triangle and by similar triangles solve for this relationship. And then with a little bit more work, you can get to this tangent relationship uh, using Euclidean geometry. And I urge all of you to try to verify these expressions. So what do we do with this? Well, recall that for an ellipse, the ratio of the orbital radius to the semi-major axis is given by that's one minus the eccentricity squared over one plus the eccentricity times cosine of the true anomaly, which using our newfound relationships, we can rewrite as one minus the eccentricity times the cosine of the eccentric anomaly. We are going to differentiate this with respect to time, and we will find this is the derivative of this term, and this is the derivative of this term. Remember, these are total derivatives in time. The over dots represent d nu dt and d e dt. And lowercase e, the eccentricity, is a constant value. We can substitute back in our definition of r into this side, and this becomes, that is, e sine nu r squared nu dot over a squared quantity 1 minus e squared. We will once again make use of our very, very useful relationship, r squared nu dot is equal to h. And we will also make use of Kepler's third law, which you'll recall we derived as r squared nu dot is equal to 2 a dot, where a is the area swept out by the orbital radius vector. And this we found was equal to 2 pi over the orbital period, t sub p, times a squared times the square root of quantity one minus e squared. We are going to define this ratio, two pi over the orbital period, as n. n is the mean motion. So n represents the average rate of the orbiting body on its orbit. So it sweeps out a full two pi radians 
over the course of an orbital period. On a circular orbit, the mean motion is the angular rate of the orbiting body everywhere, but on an eccentric orbit, it is only the average. We can further invert this relationship and solve for the orbital period. And from that, we find that we can write the mean motion as n equal to the square root of mu over a cubed. So again, n is a constant for all orbits. It represents the average angular rate of the orbiting body over the entirety of a full orbit period. So we take all this and we plug it back into our relationship here, and we write the right-hand side remains the same, and the left-hand side, which we've moved over here, is now written in terms of the mean motion and the eccentric anomaly, where we've made all of the substitutions for the various terms. And the sine is the eccentric anomaly cancels. And that means that if we also divide through by the eccentricity, we can write the derivative of the eccentric anomaly in time is equal to the mean motion over the quantity one minus the eccentricity times the cosine of the eccentric anomaly. We can integrate this with respect to time, and we get the eccentric anomaly minus the eccentricity times the sine of the eccentric anomaly is equal to the mean motion times time minus a new quantity t sub p, which is the constant of integration that we get because we've just done an indefinite integral. And we take this whole term and we define this as a new quantity, which is m, the mean anomaly. The mean anomaly can also be thought of as an angle measured from the center of the auxiliary circle and the geometric center of our orbit to some point B along the auxiliary circle. And the physical interpretation of this point B is where our orbiting body would be if it were traveling on the auxiliary circle rather than on its actual orbit. So B is the location of where you would be if you were actually traveling at the average angular rate, at the rate n, rather than at your actual true integrated rate. And that means that our interpretation of t sub p is the time of the zero point. And our zero point is defined by where we measure these angles from, which is the eccentricity direction. Recall that the eccentricity direction is also the direction of the closest approach between your orbiting body and your central body. And so T sub P is known as the time of periapsis or the time of periapsis passage. It is the absolute time at which you cross the eccentricity vector direction. And all of this together gives us what's known as Kepler's time equation. The mean anomaly is equal to the eccentric anomaly minus the eccentricity times the sine of the eccentric anomaly. So what is it that we've gained here? Because remember, we started all of this by saying that we wanted to invert our expression for the orbital radius vector and solve for the true anomaly as a function of time. M is linear in time, so that's easily solvable. But we don't want M, we want capital E, because capital E is what gets us to nu. And this is a transcendental expression, and so it is still not analytically invertible. It can be inverted via series solutions, which we'll explore shortly, but you, once again, cannot write down a closed form algebraic expression for this inversion. So what have we gained? What we've gained is numerical stability. It turns out that it's actually easier to numerically invert this than to directly invert the relationship between the true anomaly and time. And there's lots and lots of different ways to solve the Kepler time equation. In essence, the first few hundred years of astrodynamics as a hard science, starting from Newton onwards, were a deep exploration of all of the different ways that you can invert Kepler's time equation. Possibly the most straightforward way of inverting the Kepler time equation is via newton raphson iteration. And remember, newton raphson iteration is a completely general methodology for inverting equations of the form f of x is equal to zero for some real number x if you also have a gradient function for x. f prime of x is df dx. Given this setup, you can iterate and find iterants of x 
updated solutions x such that x of n plus one is equal to your previous iterant xn minus the ratio of the function evaluation of x divided by the gradient evaluation at the previous iterant. And you do this until you've converged. And convergence means that this basically stops changing at the level of some small variable epsilon. So what you're looking for is for this piece here to be less than some epsilon, where epsilon is small, potentially at machine precision. If we apply this to the Kepler time equation, we rewrite this in a form such that f of e is equal to zero, because remember, we're looking for the eccentric anomaly. The setup of this is that you are given an eccentricity and a mean anomaly, and you wish to find the value of the eccentric anomaly. Or equivalently, you're given an eccentricity and a time and a time of periapsis passage and a mean motion, which allows you to calculate m. And again, you're trying to find the corresponding value of the eccentric anomaly. And so the iterant has this form. We've just taken the derivative of this expression with respect to capital E and divided here. And the only remaining question is, how do you initialize this? What do you use for your initial step, E0? A lot of people will just set E0 equal to M. And this works a lot of the time, but this is not guaranteed to converge all of the time. And especially for higher eccentricity values, you tend to run into trouble. I like to use this form where you have a test based on the Taylor expansion, and we're going to explore further where we get this from and how well this works. And so I typically write my codes using this as an initial step, where the initial E0 is equal to the mean anomaly divided by 1 minus E if this condition is met, and otherwise is set to 6m over E to the 1 -third power. And where this comes from is from a Taylor expansion of the iterant term. So our typical case is that we have an orbit described by Keplerian elements, which include the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, the time of periapsis passage that allows us to solve for the mean motion. And from there, we can get for any point in time, the mean anomaly. We then for an array of times or for a specific time in the future or the past, calculate the eccentric anomaly. We can convert the eccentric anomaly to the true anomaly via the previously established geometric relationships. And then from there, we can calculate the position and velocity vectors. Or we can actually take a shortcut and write the position and velocity directly in terms of the eccentric anomaly as shown here. So you will recall that we previously had position and velocity in parafocal frame components parametrized in terms of the polar coordinates r and nu. And these can be directly rewritten as functions of the semi-major axis and the eccentric anomaly and the eccentricity and the semi-minor axis. And of course, the semi-minor axis can also be written in terms of the semi-major axis and eccentricity. So all of this is just still a function of that same orbital element set. And then we can differentiate this in time and find the corresponding expression for the velocity in parafocal frame components. And remember that we've already established that the time derivative of the eccentric anomaly is given by the mean motion divided by one minus the eccentricity times cosine of the eccentric anomaly. So this gives you a little bit of a shortcut where you don't actually have to go all the way to true anomaly unless you actually need the value of true anomaly for your specific purpose.